So one of the reasons why we started health optimization medicine in practice was to teach doctors and how to optimize health rather than treat disease, right? And one of those factors, we get the question a lot, why don't we check genetics? Why aren't we checking DNA? And you know, all the services out there that are checking your DNA and telling you what diet to eat or what supplements to take, but they're not checking the expression of those genes and how they're being expressed that really matters. And that's what you can do looking at epigenetic biomarkers, looking at metabolomics. And one of the things that you and I geeked out on a lot when we first started talking was metabolomics, because metabolomics is the study of the real-time cellular processes, looking how well you're utilizing your vitamins, your minerals, your nutrients, because these are the things that become epigenetic modifiers. Welcome back to the Smarter Not Harder podcast, your home for one cent solutions to $64,000 questions. I'm your host. My name is Dr. Scott Scher. Our guest on today's show is Dr. Lucia Aronica, and we've known Dr. Lucia for many years. She's a part of our health optimization medicine and practice faculty. She wrote our epigenetics module. The essential certification for health optimization medicine includes this particular module. We had a lot of fun speaking on this podcast, and here's a quick bio for Lucia. She's a lecturer at Stanford University and instructor of the Stanford Genomics Certificate. Her research and teaching focus on nutrigenomics the science of how nutrition, genetics, and epigenetics interact with each other to impact our health and longevity. Lucia has 20 years of research experience from Stanford University, the University of Oxford, the University of Vienna, the University Federico II of Napoli, as she would say because she's Italian, and the University of Southern California. She has published research papers in top-ranked peer-reviewed journals such as JAMA, Cell, and Genes and Development. Lucia has a new free webinar that's going to be available soon, so you see the links in the caption below. We had a lot of fun on this podcast, and here are a couple of things that we spoke about. Well, we first defined what epigenetics actually is, talked about common epigenetic modifications, epinutrients, endogenous bioactive compounds, the percentage of our genes contributing to obesity and diabetes, the diet fit study, the results. Was this really a high carb study versus a low carb study? Men and women in this study, the biggest losers in the study and methylation changes, epigenetic biomarkers of glucose metabolism, genes in the response to a low carb diet, something called the GPS score, low carb and mental health studies that are, that are starting just now, nutrigenomics, including metabolomics, epigenetic clocks and the various types and how and how not to use them. This was actually my favorite part of our conversation because there's a lot of interest in epigenetic clocks and Lucia actually gives a really great perspective on how to think about these and how to use them on a real-time basis. And finally, three ways Lucia lives smarter, not harder. Please enjoy this episode. Without further ado, Dr. Lucia Aronica. Dr. Lucia, good to see you. Great to see you, Scott, and thank you for having me. It's been too long since we've seen each other, either in person or on video. So it's really great to be back with you. And so I'm going to give an introduction ahead of time, as I said, but just as a reminder, Lucia has been instrumental for the nonprofit organization, Health Optimization Medicine and Practice, that we run over here and that supports the podcast. Lucia is the primary author of our epigenetics module. And I had the great benefit of meeting you in person at Stanford and talking about this module and creating a clinical framework on top of what you've been doing for so many years at Stanford with teaching epigenetics and epigenomics and things like that. So first of all, I just want to thank you for your contribution to our nonprofit organization. It's really, really appreciated. Well, my pleasure. I think science and uh, curiosity for uh, knowledge brings together people who are like-minded and have, I want to make the world a better place. Sounds corny, but I do too. I, I really do too. And so that's the whole idea with this, the podcast with the nonprofit organization, you know, trying to give doctors a new way to practice health rather than focused on disease. And that's really what I want to focus on today with you is your specialty epigenetics. And you have so much knowledge in so many places where I'd love to go. And I know you specialize in the, the world of low carb. And I know you've been a speaker at multiple low carb Denver's. Were you there this last year as well, by the no, way? No, not, not this last year. The past not this year. The no, last the, the, one before the pandemic. And it was awesome. Ah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's before I lived in Colorado. So this year I wasn't there, but I'd love to go some year. And hopefully we can connect there at the very least, since I don't live in California anymore. But I know you've been involved in the low carb world and you're a big fan of that as a potential method for many people to help optimize their their biomarkers, their epigenetic biomarkers that we'll talk about, their lifestyle biomarkers, et cetera. So we'll get there. But before we start on, let's call it probably the fun stuff for you and I, I think, I think the important thing is to kind of start off with some relative basics. We don't have to get too basic for people here because most people are going to be 
at least relatively knowledgeable when they first start listening to our podcast because we get into pretty complex topics. But when we're talking about epigenetics, let's talk about you know basic definition for now and then the most common types of modifications that we see and that we're looking at when we're looking at some of these studies and some of the other things that we're going to be talking about later. Yes. So um, the prefix epi means on the top. So if uh, uh, your genome is your DNA, then your epigenome is a set of molecules, the epigenetic marks that we will address later, uh, that are on the top of your DNA and can turn on and off. Just like a dimmer switch modulates lights up and down in, in, the room, in a room. And uh, the, the epigenetic uh, modification are also heritable through cell division. This is an important property of the epigenome. So they are, on one hand, flexible enough to be modulated by the environment, lifestyle, your daily choices. And, but on, on the other hand, stable enough to persist through cell division. And the delicate balance between this flexibility and stability is crucial to a fundamental property of the epigenome, which is called epigenetic memory. The ability of the epigenome to store a memory of your lifestyle experiences, which shouldn't be confused with the epigenetic uh, transgenerational inheritance. Another phenomenon that has been demonstrated in plants, animal, animals, and for which there is some suggestive evidence in humans too. And we can talk about mm. that later. So epigenetic mm. memory is a fundamental property of the epigenome, which is not controversial, right? And epigenetic transgenerational inheritance has not been uh, fully demonstrated yet experimentally in uh, humans, but there is evidence, strong evidence in, uh, in uh, uh, animal and plants models and, uh, and probably, um, you know, it's something that is happening also um, within us. Interesting. And so, yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, 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 go ahead. Keep no, you, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you, you were asking about the main uh, epigenetic modifications. Uh, there are, yes, yeah. I mean, the, uh, the world of epigenetics is expanding. Um, and so we are uncovering different modalities of uh, epigenetic regulations. Uh, but the most studied modifications by far are DNA methylation and histone modifications. So DNA methylation is the modification of cytosines of the letter C within the sequence of the DNA. Um, uh, and uh, these cytosines are methylated within CG nucleotide strips, which are called yeah, C right. CG dinucleotides or uh, CG islands. And, uh, um, and uh, usually methylation is a, a silencing uh, modification, DNA methylation. Not always. Right. It depends on when uh, it when it where it takes place on a gene. Uh, usually, if it's on the promoter of a gene, which is the master switch of a gene, DNA methylations tend to be a silencing modification. If it takes place within the gene, um, then uh, uh, then it can uh, uh, actually turn on. Uh, genes, so it's uh, it's complicated, but usually it's, it's a silencing modification. Whereas uh, histone modifications are modification of the histone proteins, proteins that wrap the DNA inside the cell to make it compact and organized, because mm -hmm. uh, our DNA is a very long molecule, uh, is uh, mm -hmm. six feet long and to to fit inside the cell nucleus, which is uh, three to six micron, uh, it really needs to be coiled. 
like my mm. hair and uh, <laughs> and uh, yes, yeah, okay. boiled around yeah. Yeah. proteins <laughs> proteins called histones so these histones are positively charged and the dna is negatively charged mm -hmm. so uh uh histones uh, the the, the uh, and dna together uh form the chromatin what what chromosomes are made of and the chromatin is the get getaway of uh, gene expression what i mean by that is mm -hmm. that whether whether a gene is on or off it depends on whether the chromatin is in a closed conformation in this conformation the gene cannot be read so the genes mm -hmm. are off or in an mm -hmm. open conformation and in this other um, configuration the the genes can be read and the modifications mm -hmm to the DNA through DNA methylation or histone regulate the opening and closing of the chromatin. Uh, with regard to histone modifications, this regulation happens at two levels. On one hand, we have a change, so epigenetic marks can change the electrostatic interaction between mm. histones and DNA. And by doing that, they can open the chromatin. On the other hand, right. this epigenetic modification also work as, as recruiters, as flags that are put mm. on the Easterns and call uh, or recruit uh, Eastern um, uh, modification machineries and chromatin remodeling machineries that then open the the chromatin and close the chromatin and here i want to introduce an analogy that i use usually use in my lectures so these chromatin remodeling machineries um are i call them like writer or eraser enzymes so these are enzymes that uh, can either uh, write or erase epigenetic modifications on our genes and they can also read them and so read them and then uh, uh, either open or close the chromatin and uh, these writer and eraser enzymes are really a sensor of the environment that commun that that mediates the communication between our environment and the epigenetic outputs because their function can be modulated by various things we do or are exposed to every day such as mm -hmm. nutrients in the food we eat chemicals uh, we are surrounded by uh, additives mm -hmm. uh, in our food lots of things mm -hmm. and even emotions emotions mm. we feel every day or emotions past emotions that we we had when we, in our childhood and so in a way uh, that's where sometimes you 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 hear a lot about epigenetics but people who are more in the spiritual world or you know they talk about consciousness and because epigenetics is also in a way a, a, a uh, a science that explains how emotions and uh, our thoughts can be embodied in a way, can become biology and can affect mm -hmm. our genes. So it's a, it's a very interesting science that has something for everybody, I believe. Yeah, it really does. And I love the way you've described it because it gives you a sense of just the power of understanding epigenetics and just how much is available to us now, even over the last decade or so. I mean, we were very gene centric as a community, as a population for many decades, especially with the Human Genome Project, project that finished in the early 2000s, thinking everything was gonna be solved knowing our genetic code. The problem with that, as we know now, is that how many diseases have been cured just looking at the DNA? Very, very few, because most of what's happening, as you've just eloquently described, is related to how epigenetic modifications are exerting pressure on our cells, on our body, as we embody all of these things, whether it be the food that we eat, the nutrition that we have or that we don't have, the emotions and the trauma, and how this is all being coded in various ways, or maybe coded isn't the right word, but maybe changing the expression of various 
proteins related to the expression of genes that maybe would not be expressed in various ways otherwise, or, or would be in otherwise, depending on the situation. So, um, so I think it's, it's really the power. And one of the things that you sent to me earlier, when we were first talking about epigenetics in the context of health optimization, medicine, and practice was that you thought of epigenetics as like, as the secret agent of, of health optimization medicine. And I'd love to tell if you, I mean, you've already kind of described this, but why would you, why would you classify it that way? <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm very happy you're bringing up this analogy. I remember, um, yes, I think, um, because epigenetics can, can be viewed uh, as a sort, we call it deus ex machina in uh, Latin, you know that I'm Italian and I like this expression, but in, in yeah. English you would, you could translate it into a secret agent, which is basically what- it sounds much we... better in Italian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, uh, the, what is really moving, what is happening behind the scenes at the epigenetic level when we make lifestyle choices to improve our health. So all the concept of lifestyle medicine um, really uh, is mediated at, at the biological and, and fundamental levels of, of, of the genes through epigenetics. And uh, that's why sometimes I also describe nutritional epigenetics as the science of how using food as medicine for your genes. We all, we all know in the, in the world of functional medicine that lifestyle is medicine, food is medicine and mm -hmm. uh, epigenetics uh, uh, mediates this. I've also, sometimes I use uh, uh, another, uh, uh, describe this as, in, as a concept in my lectures, um, the concept of epi wellness, which is uh, mm. this idea, this idea, just the epigenetic awareness of your lifestyle choices. And there is a bi-directional uh, relationship between, uh, I, I hope so, that by learning about epigenetics, you can reinforce your motivation about making good lifestyle choices. And on the other hand, by making good lifestyle choices, you are improving your epigenetics. So it's, a, I think, a positive feedback loop right there uh, in, uh, in this concept of uh, looking at epigenetics as a secret agent of uh, health opti of optimization medicine. Right. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. I mean, the way we always talk about this, and, and I know you talk about it this way as well, is that <laughs> I saw something funny the other day. It's and it's kind of politically incorrect, and it was it was showing a picture of uh, of New York City back in the 1920s, and it was it was like it was a colored photo, and everybody is skinny, and is and uh, the basic the basic premise is where were all the fat genes then? <laughs> 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 and I laughed out loud because there's been a lot of emphasis, and this is something we can talk about, right? That yeah. um, that it's my genetics that make me obese, <clears throat> and it's my genetics that make me fill in the blank. But we know that you know, and you could give me percentages here more than I can. But the the amount of contribution from our DNA versus our epigenetics. What, what would you say as far as the breakdown there for people, just to give them a sense of, you know, listening to people on, on, on TV and saying, well, it's my genetics because I'm obese, or it's my genetics because, I mean, we certainly know there's genetic predispositions for things on your DNA. There's no doubt about it. We have people that live over a hundred. Those people have certain genetic signatures that we're still trying to figure out. But, but what would you say to, to something like that as, as, as just a curiosity? Oh yes. So although, hundreds of uh, obesity predisposing genes have been identified. Uh, it is estimated that collectively those genes uh, um, explain less than 3% of the variance of in uh, BMI and body mass index uh, uh, among people. Um, and, 3%, uh, 3%, wow. 3%, 3%. Yeah. And, uh, you know, with diabetes, uh, uh, the type 2 diabetes, um, it is estimated that 30% is genes. But honestly, I think this is the estimation are probably um, very generous <laughs> with, type, <laughs> with type 2 diabetes. Of course, type 1 is another. It's different. Um, is different. Yeah. Uh, but um, the, the point I want to make is that, yes, there are some very rare 
genetic variants that are called fully penetrant. Um, sometimes there are also called mutations. So mutations are genetic variants that have, uh, are very rare, less than 1% in the population, and sometimes one in millions and uh, even more. Uh, and uh, uh, there are some obesity-associated mutations. So if you have, for example, in, in the leptin gene, uh, this is a famous one. So when you right. have that mutation, yes, children are obese, they overeat, and by right. giving them leptin, actually, this is a therapy, right? But th these are very rare conditions. We are we are talking here, what we are, you and I are talking about are these uh, common variants that presumably predispose people to get, gain weight or or not and many of these variants are included in a genetic uh, um, interpretation uh, um, uh, profiles you know now uh, getting a personal genetic test is very common and then uh, for example FTO is a very famous gene uh, associated uh, with uh, gaining weight with uh, mm -hmm. uh, fat, uh, the saturated fat, and uh, the, the reality is that uh, if you get, if you focus on what uh, count most, which is epi epigenetics, if you focus on what makes the 80% of a result, and this is the Pareto principle, right? <laughs> then, mm -hmm. Yes, you know this well. Yes. Yeah, then, uh, then you are, you, you are fine independently on your genetics, and there are numerous studies showing this even so for example we know that uh, people who have, who have a high polygenic risk which is many genes contributing to um, cardiovascular disease if they uh, mm. adop adopt a, 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 a favorable lifestyle with diet including diet exercise and stress reduction actually the the, the difference between them and those who are blessed with a low risk for cardiovascular disease is is cancelled. Basically, yes. yeah. we are saying that lifestyle really can cancel out and override the effect of common genetic variants, and this is powerful. And I, I see even you know friends. I have friends uh, and families that still blame their genes or some of, of some of their predispositions. But mm -hmm. the reality is that lifestyle is, is just, uh, yeah, the, the, is the, the most important thing. Uh, my, myself, I have a, a, a predisposition to be diabetic and uh, have high blood pressure and low HDL. So since I actually okay. went on a high-fat, uh, low-carb diet, my yes. HDL is so, so high. I can pick my blood report among hundreds because I have very low triglycerides because I don't eat. Sure. And there any I can carbs, get yeah. this 135 milligram per deciliter. And my triglycerides are in the between 30 and 40s. And at being your like HDL that, is 135? 135. And yeah, that's high. And, yeah. and, 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 you know, I've been uh, my, my 23 me report using the most accurate the so far most accurate yeah. method available, which are these polygenic risk scores. We can talk about later, but basically they are capturing the collective impact of many genetic variants in one number. Uh, so by using this very accurate method, I, 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 I'm, I've been told I'm predisposed to have a, a, a low HDL. And every time I go to the doctor and the, the doctor says, what is this? Ah, you are genetically predisposed to have a high HDL. They think it's the opposite. They, they, it's always the gene. They, they don't believe that the li lifestyle yeah. can, can do magic. But That's a, Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, so one of the reasons why we started health optimization medicine in practice was to teach doctors and really opt how to optimize health rather than treat disease, right? And one of those factors, we, got, we, we, get, we get the question a lot, why don't we check genetics? Why aren't we checking DNA? And you know, all the services out there that are checking your DNA and telling you what diet to eat or what supplements to take, but they're not checking the expression of those genes and how they're being expressed that really matters. And that's what you can do looking at epigenetic biomarkers, looking at metabolomics. And one of the things that you and I geeked out on a lot when we first started talking was metabolomics, because metabolomics is the study of the real-time cellular processes, looking how well you're utilizing your vitamins, your minerals, your nutrients, 
because these are the things that become epigenetic modifiers, right? These are the things that have become your, I think you describe them as epinutrients. Is that, is that what you call them? Is that right? Yes. So uh, the, 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 the conversation there is more nuanced. Yes. Epinutrients are nutrients in the food we eat that, food, okay, can, yes. uh, that modify our uh, epigenetic. So they're really the, the epigenetic uh, uh, power molecules in the food wheat. But as you mentioned, as you were mentioning, there are also metabolic cofactors uh, right. in the, that, that we produce in our body. And these sometimes are even driven not, not, not so much but by the micronutrient composition of our food, so the epinutrients. Epinutrients are usually, we are talking about micronutrients in the food wheat. Uh, mm. But by the macronutrient composition. For example, uh, an extreme yes. example would be a keto diet. A keto diet where you restrict carbohydrates, you are just manipulating, we're talking about manipulating the macronutrient composition, and by doing so, inducing your body to switch from using uh, carbohydrates as a fuel to using fat as a fuel and, and producing mm. ketones. Now, ketones right. are epigenetic modulators, are... Right actually uh, modulating the activity or some eraser enzyme. We were talking about erasers. Uh, They're H dots, yes? Yes. These are yeah. histone, they, uh, they acetylase, so they erase acetyl molecules from our histone. So that, again, uh, epigenetic and food can modify our epigen uh, epigenome through epinutrients, but also by inducing the production in our body of endogenous molecules and metabolic cofactors that also modulate. So food is so powerful. It's just such a playful tool to yeah. really uh, play with the Play-Doh of our uh, epigenetics <laughs> and be the creator of our, our best self. Let's do it. Yeah, I, I love the Plato analogy. That's a good one because they can be really molded depending on our diet, our lifestyle, our circadian rhythms. All these things really fall into the category of things that we can mold and optimize our epigenetics. One thing on the on the ketone side of things, so it's it's uh, it's, it's it's beta hydroxybutyrate yeah. that is the HDAC as well, right? Yes. Yeah. So you know, on that on that train, I wanted to talk about where a lot of your research started, which was the diet fit study over at, uh, at Stanford, right? So I want to talk a little bit about that study. And for those who haven't heard about it before, what your involvement was, and then, then from there, we'll kind of dive into because I think what, what's more interesting about even the study is some of the subgroups and, and looking at the epigenetic, epigenomic, epigenetic modify are the, the biomarkers in various groups to see which categories of people really would benefit and how you can kind of try to figure that out. So maybe start with like the diet fit study and kind of we can run down from there. Yes, the Stanford diet fit study is the reason why I moved to Stanford because it it is the follow up of a previous study called the A to Z study, which I read uh, when I was doing at that time my uh, PhD in Vienna, and the A to Z study was testing the the effects of a of a, a four diet. For, from Atkins to Zone, different carbohydrate um, composition on, uh, um, on uh, uh, weight loss and uh, blood lipids. And, uh, and basically it showed that the Atkins, di uh, Atkins diet, so the lowest carbohydrate diet of the four tested uh, was um, inducing the greatest weight loss and the lipid benefits. And this is what I, I was experiencing at that time when I first tried a low carb diet. So I decided then to join Stanford because the diet fit study is the larger version of the A to Z study, the larger randomized clinical trial ever undertaken to compare a low carb and low fat diet in a 609 men and women overweight or obese uh, who were randomized for one year to either a low carb or a low fat diet. Um, now, the beauty of the study, as you mentioned, is that this is also the largest randomized clinical trial ever undertaken in the field of personalized nutrition because we were, mm -hmm. we were collecting lots of data, genetics, and I still didn't work on that, I didn't finish work, working on that. I, I've still uh, some analysis in, uh, in the pipeline. So genetics, mm. epigenetics, 
microbiomics, other people were working on the microbiomics. Also, the microbiome paper is not uh, out yet. So what I wanted to illustrate is that this is a huge data set. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, another analysis that I'm facilitating is the analysis of bilirubin in people as a biomarker potentially of a, uh, of a low carb, um, uh, a low fat uh, predisposition. Uh, anyway, more to come. Interesting. This is yeah. a collaboration. Well, with I want to know more. The University I want to know more about of that. Vienna. I'm just saying that there are many, many things happening still with that da- data set. So although the study was uh, ended in uh, 2018 and the pub- main publication of the weight loss data was published in 2019, we still are analyzing the data sets. So wow. my first so analysis, you, you, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I think th- that's really interesting background. Um, I mean, I can't imagine how much data you guys collected and how much is still to be, it's still to be figured out. But yeah. um, I think, I love I love that you're trying to figure out, and this is what I'm interested in talking to you about in a minute, but you're trying to figure out what these biomarkers are that you can look at, say, this is the population of people that would really benefit from being on a low-carb diet. This is the population that maybe wouldn't benefit because we'll talk about the results of the of the study at least and then maybe some of the the challenges of interpretation of those results as well. Yes, yes. So uh uh, just to to go straight to your question and uh, the uh, so the, the main study didn't show any difference in weight loss between uh, people who followed a low carb or a low fat diet but then now hmm. we are nailing down and looking at, at different subgroups of people people with different epigenetic marks people with different microbiomic signatures and so on. So the first um, uh, publication that um, uh, uh, I, I was uh, leading for this study was I was looking at men and women. And uh, okay. we found out that actually um, the men lost more weight and body fat on the low carb diet compared to the low mm-hmm. diet. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, and uh, the the we, and we're also following the diet more uh, with a greater adherence, so they were more compliant. Where they were eating more fat and less carbohydrates compared to the women. Mm. Uh, the the women lost the same amount of weight on a low carb and a, a low fat diet, despite not following the, the, the low-carb diet as well as the low-fat diet. Quickly. So basically, they were not cutting carbohydrate enough and they were not eating enough fat. So basically, mm. compliance being equal, everyone was, eat, was losing more weight and more fat on the low-carb diet. If we were l- focusing on... So, so if you look at this... Deep, of the, adherence, right. Yeah. Yeah, so this right. was just, it was not a molecular analysis. It was really looking at people, people, different yeah. people, even just the, the, the most obvious difference that we have, men and women and behavior. And I think this is right. important because unfortunately, the low fat industry is targeting mainly women. So every, yeah, so every, every low fat yogurt uh, at the supermarket is pink. We know that. Oh yes, of course. Okay. Yes, yeah. So it's it's not a surprise that people uh, women they don't are make pink barbecue grills, do they? Yeah, and, <laughs> and of course, you know, this is if you don't increase your fat intake, is then you are not able to stick to the diet and uh, enjoy it. So you know, there are some considerations uh, to make there, and then another mm. analysis. Uh, I, I did. Uh, I conducted two analyses on the epigenetics that we didn't publish yet. I can already okay. reveal something because, you know, un- until we publish the data, there are so many angles that we can look at. Uh, and, you know, I would love to have some collaborators on this because these data sets, at Stanford, we have the luxury of having too many projects to work on. And so some projects get deprioritized. But basically, we have a genome-wide, yeah. we looked in the first analysis, I looked at the, at the whole Epigen- methylome, DNA methylome changes in people in the mm. biggest losers 
of the study. The one who lost. So the methylome the, would be the, the methyl. So we're talking about methyl groups. We're talking about um, DNA modifications. Yes. DNA, DNA so methylation. I was yes. looking uh, yeah. at DNA methylation uh, because DNA methylation is the uh, the epigenetic modification we can most reliably and accurately um, uh, measure. Uh, so right. focusing on that, I was looking at the DNA methylome of uh, the biggest biggest losers of the study, the one who, who lost the greatest amount of weight um, mm -hmm. and uh, um, on a low fat and low carb diet, men and women. And uh, we uh, it was incredible to see that there was a very little overlap in terms of DNA methylation changes between the diets. So basically, a very, you know, the weight loss driven by two distinct diet drives very different changes in the, the, the DNA methylome. I mean, this is mm. just by itself. That's pretty amazing. Very interesting. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, so we, it's not an end process. It's something happening very separately to cause the weight loss in these two, two different populations. And then we just looked at the first, the top, uh, you know, the, the top 10, the top 20 uh, regions uh, that changed uh, the DNA methylation before and after the diet. And uh, we uh, we found interesting and things and confirmation like on a, on a, a low carb diet, there were uh, changes, the, the greatest changes were in uh, um, genes responsible for fat metabolism, right? So basically you are starting to burn more fat and use the fat in the food you eat. Uh, in the low right. carb, uh, in the low fat diet, there were also uh, interesting changes in uh, genes um, uh, uh, involved in the protection uh, uh, to um, uh, colon cancer. Uh, mm. So, it, again, the, the, the analysis is not done yet. We could do so much more. It depends on what the questions that we ask. But basically what I can tell you is that there, were, there was very little overlap and the, the changes were huge. I'm talking about like 10 to 40% change in DNA methylation. It, uh, it wow. besides, whereas the, the studies uh, conducted before our study were showing on average a 5% change. So I'm talking of you about huge uh, changes, probably because we were focusing on the biggest losers there. Um, and then uh, the other analysis says that, that uh, touches more on the topic of personalized nutrition and biomarkers, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. We looked uh, at um, uh, a specific uh, biomark epigenetic biomarker of uh, diabetes um, and uh, uh, is, um, uh, is within a gene, as a DNA methylation uh, modification within mm. a, a gene called ABCG1, which is a diabetes-related gene uh, okay. and, uh, uh, that gets more methylated, so turned off as people gain weight. And is it believed that this process of gaining weight then turns off this gene, and then this in turn contributes to impair glucose control? And mm, so okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's a biomarker of beginning uh, glucose control uh, uh, abnormalities before they actually happen. Um, and we, uh, we look at that and uh, we see that a reduction of the methylation at that site on both diets. Again, we didn't end the, the, that analysis for various reasons. Also connected to my personal stories that uh, at that time, then I, I had to uh, go back to the European Union to start this mm. Rubin collaboration. And then when I came back, I had other projects waiting for me, but of course. I will, I will, uh, I will get there. And also let's, let's, uh, let's remember, I I'm teaching also. And uh, I was, right. I was, I was involved, involved with your uh, great yeah, students. program. Yes. Yeah, so I, you know, it's, I have only one life and many things I love doing, but I will get to that publication. But the, the good news is that basically we have epigenetic biomarkers of diabetes and losing weight on a whole food diet is good for you because both diet, the low carb and low fat were anyway healthy. So based on, on health or whole foods and therefore they were both low 
carbohydrate compared to the standard American diet. This is a point I want to make. So, Please. Yeah. So, just, so you, this is, you're referring to the study itself, right? As far as the, the, the two groups. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So talk, talk about that for a minute. And also, yeah. and also in general, we, you, you asked me about, you know, we can generalize this from the study to everyone who is listening. Because I've been, uh, I'm, I've, I'm asked this question over and over. What is the best diet? Right. And then personalization. So I right. think, I think 80% of the equation of a healthy diet is focusing on whole food, whole non-processed food. By mm -hmm. doing so, you will hit a lot of uh, things that we, everyone, we, we all agree on having more uh, 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 nutrient dense food. Because processed food, right. yeah. Uh, also lowering carbohydrates. So it's not contro controversial that we should uh, we should lower our intake of refined carbohydrates and sugar. I think do you have some are... numbers that you, that you that you know of already, Lucia? Compared to what was in the Diet Fit study, compared to like the average American, what was the difference there? Or typically, the difference you... there was that. Uh, people were encouraged to get their carbohydrates mainly from fruits, legumes, uh, grains, ah. whole, it, not whole grain products, because it's also different. Whole grain bread, no, the, the actually the whole grains, which is still much, I mean, it's still a low carbohydrate diet. Who is doing this diet? I mean, I think this would be considered a low carb diet by most people, and it was in a way. Right. But right. then we so had. So their high, their high carb diet was really like a low carb whole food diet, yeah. is really what you mean, com to, compared to the average American. Yeah. Right. The right. average American, unfortunately, uh, gets most of their carbohydrates from refined carbohydrates and sugar. Right. That's, that's right. the way it is. Yeah. So I think really the message there is, okay, universally and not controversial, let's stick to whole food. And you will yes. get anyway a reduction in carbohydrates for sure and uh, a, an increase uh, intake in uh, micronutrients and epinutrients, what I care most yes. about. Uh, and you will also stimulate the production in your body of this metabolic cofactor and endogenous epigenetic modulators that I we were uh, touching um, uh, mm -hmm. on before. And so this is the universal part. Then there is a 20% of personalization. So how low with carbohydrates should you go? Uh, is dairy good for you? Is uh, um, should you um, uh, how much uh, uh, green leafy vegetables should you be eating? Do you require more? Uh, can you uh, use plant based omega trees or should you rely only on marine based omega trees? So these are the nuances. That's where right. I also think, and that's where nutrigenetic can help. Uh, yeah. I, so talk about this, the science of nutrigenetics a little bit and how you how you think so, about that. Uh, you know, there are, for example, these things I, I mentioned about personalization. Um, right. Uh, uh, okay. There are two factors. There is a, a there is a, you know how low with carbohydrates should you go depends not right. not so much on genetics. I think it's on your metabolic state and your mental state. For example, we know that a ketogenic diet um, is a, is a very effective uh, um, uh, approach for type two diabetes and metabolic right. uh, disturb disturbances and uh, uh, but also for mental health i'm now part of right. a, a network of uh, researcher clinicians it's called the metabolic mind i encourage you to I've check heard. it out um, and it's 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 an inspiring community uh, who is uh, uh, promoting the idea that food can be medicine not only for for uh, uh, the body but also for the brain and there is an intimate connection between metabolic health and brain health and it's not only about keto i think it's about finding the degree of carbohydrate restriction that can help you improve your metabolic health and brain health. So this is a level of personalization, right? We are talking about yeah. looking at your 
uh, uh, met metabolomics and your and 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 assess your metabolic status based on blood lipids and other things, and then we personalize. So this is the first level of personalization. Then there is the nutrigenetic part that can also help refine. So independently of where you are on your metabolic health journey, you carry some genetic variants that may predispose you, for example, to activate less folate from the folate you eat from the green mm -hmm. vegetables. So you need more of uh, to eat more green leafy vegetables. For example, this is a the very well known MTHFR uh, variant. Um, right. uh, there are... This is what we can measure using metabolomics, for example. Right, we can measure these kinds of gene expression challenges, like the MTHFR gene, is a very common genetic heterogeneity. I don't even like calling it a mutation because it's so common in the population. <clears throat> but certain people have various abilities to methylate their folate, like you said, but you can measure this. So you don't have to know the, de the gene is not as helpful as actually measuring. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, and actually, even yeah. if you have the genetic information, you could have both, right? You, you, right. If you have the genetic information, I would not modify the, the, your diet just based on that because then it depends on your actual folate status that you measure by right. what you call me me metabolomics, your homocysteine yes. level, because then mm -hmm. folate is also affecting your homocysteine. So th and then actually you use those clinical markers as a response biomarker of how well you respond to modifying your diet by uh, uh, taking a, a B vitamin complex supplement or le le eating more uh, leaf ling, uh, leafy greens. So the clinical biomarkers, you are absolutely right, are, are crucial and are always, mm -hmm. you always need to measure them if you, nutrigenetics is only another piece of the puzzle. It can also be nice to see where is, is, is nutrigenetics really describe your genetic predispositions and the, the metabolomics is what you actually are doing with your so what's work. happening right now yeah. so it was happening right now so i think it's nice to have both um but you know yes. other other things that nutrigenetics can help with uh, for example the, i was talking about omega uh, 3 and omega 6s um yeah. Uh, this is also a controversial topic. Are, for example, omega sixes in uh, vegetable oils bad for you or not? It turns out yes. that you know there are some genetic polymorphisms who predispose some people to produce more inflammatory molecules when they mm -hmm. put they those vegetable oils higher in omega sixes, right? Anyway, yes. we know that eating too much of those is not good for you anyway. Also, because yes. they are containing <laughs> processed food. So if you avoid them, is is the best, is best. But it's, it's interesting right. to see how, you know, there are some people who are predisposed to um, to have right. more infl inflammation. And this is a, a, a polymorphism in uh, uh, in the omega-3 and omega-6 uh, um, uh, pathway in our body that basically uh, helps us uh, use uh, external sources of, uh, uh, for example, plant-based omega-3s to uh, transform them in the biologically active EPA and DHA, which, has, which are those we can get from fish. Uh, or marine sources supplements, right? And this pathway, mm -hmm. variation is this pathway cannot not only tell you whether you are actually able to effectively use the plant base to produce the DHA and the APA. Most people are, aren't. And even those who are blessed with good genetics have 8% conversion average. Eight. Eight wow. percent. No. It's very, it's very. What, what is it for the animal? What is it? Do you know have a, have a comparison? No, from I mean, the... if it's the animal is already active. So. Right. Okay. That's what, I, that's what I was going to say. Basically, we are going, we, we our body yeah. can produce, a, so these uh, uh, omega trees are, you know, same, uh, is, is conditionally essential nutrients, which means, you know, exactly. we can, we can synthesize them from the from plant based, but this conversion rate goes down with age. It mm -hmm. uh, uh, is on average eight percent. I think that men convert less 
but mm. anyway is even is is a modest conversion rate for everybody and so and right. then Very genetics fun, yeah. can make things worse again here you may just say it's better to get uh, uh animal based or omega trees for everybody right. i mean but yeah you may we have, talk about this a lot yeah. yeah but you may have an additional reason for you know there are so right. many things that where genetics is almost more it can be used as a as a as a behavioral tool i see this also with smoking sure. uh, there are some people who are just predisposed to uh, unfortunately uh, and this the enzymes in the detox pathway uh, have uh, uh, just uh, the experience more harm from smoking and environmental toxicants and again this is bad for everybody but look if but you know that you are risk, vulnerable yeah. you may it may help you make a decision yeah yeah, I, I think that's well, well said. I mean, we talk about this and I, I talk about this in my personal practice when I speak to people that do not eat animal protein, for example, I often find their nutrient deficient a lot of times. They, they may do okay initially, but it's really hard because of the bioavailability of things like omega-3s and other things like the, the bioavailable B vitamins, for example, that you don't get uh, that are already, they're already methylated for you from the animals, for example, uh, rather than your body having to activate them in your system. So it's possible to be healthy that way, uh, to not eat meat, but it's very, very difficult is what I often tell people. And as you said, like there's also these, these, uh, these genetic predispositions that may not be an issue, uh, but if you're eating lots of processed foods with omega-6 and you have a predisposition, it's just like, it's like, like kerosene on the fire kind of thing. Like, like and, and so it's, it's not, it's not a good scene <laughs> at all. So um, this is really where it, it really becomes important. And I, you alluded to this and and where we're where we are really big proponents as well is you need to test you need to see what what's going on underneath the hood for these uh, for people and look at metabolomics look and look at nutrigenomics and understand and then the other piece which i just want to go back to for a second which i find so exciting because i know dom i think dom diagostino is part of this work with the the mental health collaboration as well if i'm not mistaken yeah yes Yes, he's also yeah. part. He's, he's a he's a huge community. He's also part of. Yeah, it. you guys have such a big community, and, and I and I've been. I know that the Metabolic Health Summit has its own podcast now, and they've been doing. A lot, I think have you been on there yet, or I think you have been. Yes, or you're going to be. Or, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm excited for that. I'm excited for Dom, who is on this show too, um, because I think you know from like the mental health perspective, you know, we forget that the that the brain is attached to the body, <laughs> and everything that's happening in the body is also going to be affected in the brain. One thing I've heard you talk about, and I don't know if this is pertinent or not, but you talked about something called a GPS score, like basically somebody's response to a low carb carbohydrate diet. Can you can you touch upon that for a minute? Yes, the GPS score is another name of the polygenic score. It stands for genome wide uh, polygenic uh, score, and uh, um, and basically uh, the, the, a GPS score is a uh, is a way of capturing with one number the collective impacts of many genes on, okay. on, on a given trait or response to diet in our case. Uh, and the, right. the most accurate uh, genetic tool so far to predict um, complex trait or response to diet. And so we are um, uh, looking at ways of looking at more genes because um, uh, the, in the first publication of the studies, uh, study, we looked at three genetic variants that are okay. very often reported on this uh, genetic interpretation tool to predispose you to, to do better on a low carb or a low fat diet. The result, it didn't matter. The, those mm. genetic di diets were not doing anything. Um, so we want now to give a second chance to, uh, to uh, nutrigenetics and see um, and look at whether uh, coming up with a, a GPS score, uh, so aggregating together um, hundreds or uh, more um, of those variants uh, can uh, uh, change things. Again, I think this would be in a clinical practice, you know, if, uh, if we find something and you decide to use this uh, GPS in your practice, this will be one little element. Right, it's one tool, you, right. Uh, uh, make the decision because of course, metabolic status, I think is going to be more important for clinicians to, uh, as I said, you know, to, to guide 
people toward a diet or another one. So, of course, if you are, for yeah. example, if you are already, uh, you have poor glucose management control, independently, if you are blessed <laughs> with a G, with a, a GPS that right. can dispose you to uh, do well on a, on a high carb diet, I think you shouldn't do that, right? So, right, uh, right, yeah. It, the key as a clinician always is look at the patient in front of you oh, right? yes. <laughs> and treat them and don't treat the score or yeah. the numbers. It's, and, and I think that we get lost in the data these days because we, get, we have so much more of it. But I think the GPS score sounds like another tool in the toolbox that will help potentially work with your, you can work with your patients in a way uh, that will allow them more data and more evidence that they need to make certain changes in their lifestyle and their diet and, and take various supplements or whatever. And I think the other one that I wanted to chat about, because I know we're kind of running out of time, this is important to me, and I think people listening is, you talked about smoking, right? And we talked about that being a big issue. And some people are more sensitive to the toxins in smoking. And one of this, what this kind of comes into my mind, what comes into my mind from here is, there's been a big focus on epigenetic clocks and how these can help predict biologic versus chronologic age or the difference between the two. And also the grim age clock, which hasn't been commercialized yet, but the idea that you can predict your first heart attack, your first uh, grim aged type of thing, basically when something's gonna go south. Uh, I wanted to get your sense of kind of where things are in that world these days, Lucia, and like where pe people should be thinking about using this in their, in their clinical practice or you know, as a, if they're a patient, you know, when they should be talking to their practitioner about maybe getting one of these tests done. Yes, we have only uh, less than 10 minutes, so this is a very complex uh, topic. Um, I'm going actually to give uh, um, uh, a talk about uh, this. On uh, There is a Stanford event on longevity uh, soon. Oh, and, good. Uh, yes, it will be a fun one. But we'll link to it here. Yeah. yeah so we can make sure yeah. we have the longer form. Yeah. yeah. And um, so um, in a nutshell, okay, what is chronological age and biological age? Perhaps your, your listeners are familiar with that, but chronological age is what we celebrate at our, at our birthday and biological age is a construct. We don't know, we don't have a definition of it. Is the is the, the physiological age, molecular age and of your tissues and cells. And it's not one thing. Depending on which tool you use to measure it, you have a different readout. And so mm -hmm. the const if you would if we would identify all the tools possible and create you know a, a composite score that would be probably an estimate of your biological age. But the the idea of the biological age is that your true age of your cells and tissues. And just know that there are lots of ways currently to estimate it and probably we'll have more later. Uh, uh, usually the, the way of estimating uh, biological age is uh, true, can be through functional biomarkers. So what you collect uh, in your practice, even blood lipids, mm -hmm. inflammatory markers, metabolomics, these are functional right, yeah. clocks, right? And then there are digital clocks, even like if uh, you take a picture of yourself, we are very good at face recognition, right? You can estimate the, the are you, you, do you look younger or older than who you are? And this is, a, could be a digital clock, right? Is a, is a, is the biological clock uh, age versus the chronological age. And finally, we have mm. these molecular mm. clocks. Epigenetic clocks are one of these molecular clocks. And... Um, epigenetic, because epigenetic um, can capture our lifestyle information and because it changes with time, we didn't touch on that, but there are some age associated epigenetic changes. Right. Then, like more methylation, for example. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There are, there are things that go up and down with age. Then we can use epigenetic clocks, which are basically uh, capture the methylation changes at hundreds or thousands of CPG on your epigenome, we can use them to estimate the passing of time, biological time. Is this going, is your inner clock ticking faster or slower? Mm -hmm. 
than uh, the, the, your watch. And so uh, we, but, but uh, now uh, you mentioned one of these clocks. There are different epigenetic clocks. Some of them are more accurate at uh, predicting chronological age. And this could be used, okay. are really like the correlation is very close. And for example, the first generation Horvat clock, um, this could be, for example, applied for forensic purposes. If you have a sample, you can say, okay, this was this this the, 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 this was a man of thirty year, years old, right? Mm -hmm. But some other clocks seem to reflect more biological age, and uh, uh, the, these are especially the second generation clocks that are derived that don't they don't necessarily they don't directly they they were uh, 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 developed by looking at functional changes, the blood mm -hmm. lipids and the proteins in your blood, and then looking at the correlation between these and the epigenetics and focusing or, on those epigenetic changes. What I want to stress in this uh, uh, little complicated explanation is that basically they are more, they are capturing more functional changes. They are designed, the algorithm is developed to capture functional changing changes in your body. And the green age clock that you mentioned is one of these. And uh, um, yeah, um, as you mentioned, can really estimate um, uh, uh, even time to that. Uh, now, yeah. uh, we, um, uh, at the beginning, before the pandemic, we wanted actually to look at the uh, green age clock uh, in our diet fit study. And we may do that. I mean, if uh, if Steve Orvat is uh, listening to this, uh, uh, I hope he remembers of this uh, <laughs> initial collaboration. Uh, we are still interested. Um, in the meantime, there are other clocks um, coming uh, coming up. There is also a recent clock, uh, Dunedin Pace of Age, which is actually measuring the pace of mm. aging and it might be a better tool for estimating uh, biological age in younger people makes sense uh, and in younger. Or, okay. also in the in the context of lifestyle um uh changes but that... i i just want to work uh, to just give uh, uh tell people to be cautious right i mm. I, I love science and everything but uh we still don't have uh, um, a clear um, uh, clarity on the clinical utility uh, uh, or even personal utility of these clocks. For example, uh, we anecdotally, we know that uh, people who exercise a lot tend to be biologically older. And we don't know, it doesn't necessarily mean that these people are going to live uh, um, uh, 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 not as long as other people or that they, they look older. But this might reflect a transient epigenetic uh, response of inflammation. You know, for example, the inflammation is, uh, is necessary to mediate some of the benefits of exercise, right? But course, it might yes. give you an aging signal that is, trans is, is going there. It doesn't clinically mean anything. Right. Or so on one end, we have these very health, healthy, biology, functionally healthy people who have who are epigenetically older. And on the other hand, we also need to uh, uh, understand that there are some uh, dietary modifications. Right. For example, fasting. Or even a plant based diet that have been associated with a, a slowing of the epigenetic clock because they are um, uh, the, these interventions either through calorie restriction or through restriction right. of animal based um, food. They are going to regulate the um, mTOR pathway, which is uh, basically um, uh, a, ga uh, uh, um, um, a gatekeeper of the cell right. that tells you whether you are going to anabolism or catabolism. Are you building right. or destroying? Usually you start right. destroying and you are entering a, a stress a resilient catabolic state. Yeah. 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 But yeah. what I want to say, and this can be good for many people for obvious reasons, because we know we are, most people are overweight and have a metabolic issue and I think they can benefit from it. So in that case, they go on a fasting diet, 
they lose weight and their epigenetic clock will also show accordingly a younger age. But right. there are some people, for example, and I always talk about my mother because is a, is a, she's, a, she's close to me. She's 82. She's frail, mm. right? She's frail. If she uh, starts like the, the going on, on a vegan diet or a, or a, or a uh, the fasting, anyway, she, uh, she may have, she may become epigenetically younger, but worsen her frail. And then tomorrow yeah. she falls and she dies earlier. Well, the, the point right. is, <laughs> it's really practical. <laughs> yeah, I, I want just to say, you know. We, no, this is perfect. And, yeah. uh, because uh, the people don't really grasp, grasp these little uh, nuances. And, these are nuances. Uh, I love yeah. epigenetics and I love epigenetic clocks and I'm working on them and I want the field to advance. But still everything in context though right that's what you mean you yes. know i think Cont that I, you have to look at yeah yeah, yeah. i mean i, I 100 percent agree that um if you're already frail and you go fasting and you're going to get sarcopenic and lose <laughs> muscle mass it's not a good idea yeah so, and you don't care again, if you're epigenetically younger right that's yeah exactly I'm, I'm 40 years old but i broke my hip because i don't have any muscle <laughs> anymore where <laughs> my bones my bones don't actually mineralize yeah. it's, it's so interesting yeah. because everybody wants to have that you know that one thing that's going to flip them over and say okay i'm epigenetically 10 years younger and I, that means everything else is going to be fine, right? Everything, but but no, it's it's so much more nuanced than that. I really appreciate your nuanced conversation about this, Lucia, because I use epigenetic clocks in my practice, but I use them in a nuanced way for these particular reasons. It depends on what their goals are. It depends on how old they are. It depends on what other medical problems that they ha they have. Because yes, maybe going plant based or doing fasting is a really good idea for them. But that's probably more related to their metabolic health anyway than it is their epigenetic health, ep 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 epigenetic biologic age versus their chronologic age, for example. So um, I know that there's a lot more we could talk about here on this, but um, I think it's funny. You know, I was talking to Dr. Ted about this the other day. We keep waiting for the grim age to get uh, to get commercialized, but I don't think anybody wants to be the company that tells you when you, you're going to die, do they? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's true although again i think i think there is room for uh, you know those yes that, yes exactly I, I, I think, it's the same thing right yeah i am i i am i i am a positive i have a positive and proactive attitude to my health and life and uh, i think that's uh, our mission to communicate this to people and so I'm very grateful for, uh, uh, for yeah, I'm, 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 I'm very thankful for this invitation. I love hanging yeah. out with people. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah, I invite people also to follow me um, on social media, Instagram. I'm also thinking of launching, actually I'm doing it uh, now that I'm committing. Um, uh, in nice. May, uh, I think a free um, webinar um, uh, uh, called Ask Dr. Lucia Ronica. You can sign up um, uh, at uh, diararonica.podia.com. Uh, and uh, I would love to see you there. Just ask me every, anything awesome. about epigenetics, longevity, uh, and you will find there also a, a mini course. And strength training. Come on. You yeah. can talk, you know, it's not you're, strength, strength training, although, yes. <laughs> uh, I've, uh, I finally launched a mini course. It's a, a smaller version. It's not the same that I'm offering with you guys. Uh, it's a smaller version of a professional course for epigenetics from uh, uh, showing um, updated content from my Stanford genomic certificate uh, course. And uh, this is a um, uh, this is just a, a, a for professionals, not targeted for to clinicians and any professionals. Awesome. And just I want to make top class education available to everybody and uh, without breaking the bank. Yeah, that's beautiful. Okay, Lucia, I have one more question for you. You can make it quick. I know you have to go, but what we like to ask everybody at the end of the podcast is, what are the three recommendations you have? for somebody to live smarter, not harder. And this could be in the worlds of epigenetics, in the worlds of uh, emotional health. It could be going to Mexico and spending time with your family, whatever you want, want to do here. But uh, that's where Lucia is at the moment, by the way. So she's, she's on vacation to <laughs> spend some time with us, which we're really appreciative of. But yeah, so three things that, maybe three takeaways for people that are listening from your own personal life or professional, whichever you choose. Yes, I think uh, I will start with the um, with food and exercise. Uh, so uh, find uh, find pleasure 
So rediscover and redefine what pleasure is. The key mm. to sticking to a, a plan, a food plan and exercise is, uh, uh, is uh, finding pleasure in it. We, 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 we all follow, follow pleasure. So if you rediscover, for example, what healthy food tastes like um, and uh, what, how, uh, uh, you know, you, you develop a good ad addiction, how, how great it feels to exercise. At the beginning, it might be difficult to start a new habit, but then mm -hmm. when you really focus on not, not, oh, I need to do that, no, I want look at a new diet or a new exercise plan with curiosity and look for pleasure. And this will stick. And so this is my foundation. Pleasure every day through food and exercise and things that make my body happy. And then mm. I have um, connection, connection, human connections. Um, I I have a strong relationship with my family, my mother, my sisters, and I think those are mm -hmm. really my anchor point. And then from that anchor point, the third element is to just, just using that anchor with, imagine a balloon is attached to an anchor that can fly everywhere. And uh, so seek new, uh, new experiences. Be open, mm -hmm. continuous learning. Open. I see, I look at me, you know, I'm a, a mix of, uh, I'm very independent and uh, I go everywhere. I have a life. I've lived in so many countries and still I'm anchored. And I, I think a mix of, I think these are my three elements. So lifestyle and lifestyle and, and beauty and then an anchor, attachment, a human relationship, but also fly and explore mm -hmm. and always always seek new experiences. I think these are my, my three. Always curious. I could tell with you, you're oh, always yes. looking. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. And I just want to thank you so much again for spending more time than you planned with me today to talk about this. And um, we'll definitely link to your, your website, dralonica.com. You have your Instagram uh, as well and uh, your new courses. And please follow her and check out what she's doing um, and always up to more things than she can chew at the same time. But I'm always excited to, to talk to you. I can't wait to one day be in person again in some, some same, similar location. But again, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This has been another episode of the Smarter Not Harder podcast. Thanks so much for listening, and we hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please head over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your shows and leave us a five-star review. This would be super helpful. And while you're at it, go to YouTube and click subscribe. We had a great time, Lucia and I speaking. I really hope you got some really interesting information from here that you can take home and start using in real time in your own lives. Thanks again for tuning into the Smarter Not Harder podcast, your home for one cent solutions to $64,000 questions. See you next time.